Good evening to all. My name is Ioannis Panopoulos and I'm assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry at the University of South Florida. The Spanopoulos group works on the development of hybrid multifunctional materials, uh, targeting applications spanning from solar cells and LEDs to photocatalysis, spintronics, solid state batteries, water disinfection and water purification applications. Uh, the title of this talk is Generating Porosity to Metal Halide Semiconductors. And I will discuss and showcase why this is uh, very important and, and what new applications arise by generating porosity to this important class of uh, semiconductor materials. Semiconductors are core components of almost every electronic device we utilize in our everyday lives uh, for solid state lighting, uh, for solid state solar cells. Um, we can create highly efficient transistors, capacitors, um, hard radiation detectors, and so on. Uh, when scientists manage to generate porosity to full inorganic semiconductors, creating uh, porous silicon, porous germanium, porous gar masonite, and porous indium phosphide, then the generation of porosity not only improved their optoelectronic properties, but also allowed them to be utilized in uncommon for them applications, such as photocatalysis, integrating waveguides, and photonic crystals. One very important family of semiconductors is the family of halide perovskite materials, and especially the hybrid halide perovskites. These compounds were named after the natural occurring mineral perovskite, or calcium titanate. Um, and their general formula is ABX3. Uh, and the structure consists of corner sharing BX6 octaedra that propagate the three directions. Whereas in the form cubotahedral cavities, alpha side cations reside, such balancing the structure. Uh, at that time, when these compounds were discovered, they thought that calcium titanate was cubic at room temperature. Uh, however, calcium titanate is orthorhombic at room temperature. Therefore, when we refer to the uh, cubic aristotype structure of perovskite compounds, we refer to the structure of strontium titanate, which is cubic at room temperature. Now, if we replace the alpha side cation with bulky organic counter cations, then a whole new family of hybrid halide perovskites emerges, each one with unique properties, starting by the 3D formamidinium lead iodide perovskite, where the alpha side cation is formamidinium, to uh, the 3D defective MABI perovskites, uh, 1D, 2D corrugated perovskites, and 2D loose and popper type of perovskites. As you can imagine, this unique structural versatility allows us not only to fine-tune the composition, but also to fine-tune the optical, mechanical, and electronic properties of the corresponding materials. Uh, now, this per these materials uh, feature a combination of traits that cannot be found to any other class of fully organic or fully inorganic semiconductors, such as long carry diffusion lengths and lifetimes, hard radiation damage tolerance, and solution processability. Uh, and for these reasons, there is immense effort for the commercialization of these compounds. Um, um, therefore, um, as you can imagine, um, if, if I, we find a way to generate porosity to this important class of materials, then this would allow them to be utilized to applications beyond photovoltaics, uh, such as sensing, solid state batteries, photocatalysis, and integrating waveguides. So how this is possible? Um, I would say that it's quite challenging, or at least it was quite challenging at in, uh, recently. So there is a family of, of materials which are called open framework metal halides, where the use of bidentate or multidentate 
bulky counter cations can give rise to uh, structures which with which feature uh, cavities and channels, and they look like a porous network. However, the corresponding counter cations act as templating agents and they block the pores of these compounds. Therefore, these materials are not porous uh, because the cavities are blocked by these uh, counter cations. And there is also lack, lack of gas option studies that can prove its uh, porous nature. Uh, so, but how then, how it's possible to generate porosity? In this, uh, in general, so for uh, porous inorganic compounds, there are usually two methods that are utilized. The first one is they're using uh, templating methods, using a, so a soft template like a polymer, or a hard template like uh, a mesoporous silica matrix. And then by removing the template, a porous structure is acquired. And the second method is using electrochemical dissolution or etching methods to dissolve part of the material to generate porosity. Um, in another family of materi porous materials, such as metal organic frameworks, for example, then the um, uh, there are solvent molecules that reside in the cavities of the material. And then by using different activation protocols, such as solvent exchange or supercritical carbon dioxide, then it's possible to remove the solvents from the cavities, thus acquiring a porous network. However, in the case of uh, hybrid metahalide uh, semiconductors, the counter cations, the organic ligands, act as templating agents and they're actually part of the structure, so they cannot be removed without structural collapse, as in the case of MOFs or as in the case of um, fully porous inorganic, fully inorganic porous semiconductors. So we must find a way, another way, something uh, different, something unique to generate porosity to this uh, class of materials. So how this can be possible then? So we came up with a general strategy where we utilized molecular cages as both structure directing agents and counter cations. So in that case, reaction of the DHS, the 2 2 cryptant with lead in acidic media gave rise to the first porous metal halide semiconductor. This is a 2D structure consisting of um, single inorganic layers of lead bromide clusters that are separated and charge balanced by a single organic layer of molecular cages. The molecular cages are double protonated, acting as counter cations for the anionic inorganic framework. And this is an out of plane projection showcasing a single inorganic layer and a single organic layer. You can see the hexagonal arrangement motif of the organic ligands, that are, uh, which is templated by the protruding uh, inorganic cluster. Having a closer look at the inorganic uh, layer, this is the out of plane projection of a single inorganic layer. Uh, the layer consists of phase sharing lead bromide clusters and this cluster connectivity gives rise to these cavities in plane. The cluster consists of uh, two types of polyedra, two capped uh, trigonal prisms and three and the chydra. <clears throat> uh, corresponding uh, lead bromide distances are uh, range from 2.8 angstrom to 3.5 angstrom for the uh, cap trigonal prisms, which are typical for seven connected bromide atoms, uh, seven connected bromide, uh, seven connected lead um, polyhedra, uh, and the uh, bond lengths for the and the chydra lay from 2.8 to 3.6 angstrom exhibited a little higher distortion, uh, had higher elongation than common um, uh, bond lengths found in 
um, uh, lead bromide 8 and the chydra. The corresponding material is water stable for over a year. Uh, you can see uh, this uh, comparison of the calculated PXRD patterns, the fresh ones, and the after one year immersed in liquid water. There is no additional peaks from, formed, um, and there is no loss of crystallinity. And this can you can see also the uh, the surface of the crystals of the fresh crystals. This is an SEM image, and after six months in water, there is no surface degradation. Now, in order to uh, validate the porous nature of the corresponding materials, we performed gas and vapor sorption studies because this is the only way to demonstrate that something is uh, a porous material is indeed porous. Um, so, um, carbon nitrogen sorption studies and carbon dioxide uh, studies revealed no gas uptake. Therefore, we uh, performed vapor sorption studies, uh, uh, water at room temperature, and we observed uh, a fully reversible sorption isotherm for both water and deuterium oxide. Um, this means that our material is ultra microporous and um, because the kinetic diameter of water is much smaller than that of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Uh, and therefore, the material practically acts as a molecular sieve. In order to um, validate whether water is indeed inside the cavity, inside the structure, and not just on the surface of the material, we perform solid-state NMR studies. This is the uh, proton uh, NMR, 1D NMR uh, studies. Uh, so this is the NMR spectrum of the pristine molecular cages, molecular cage, where you can see the two types of protons are not easily uh, distinguishable. However, if you age the material after 18 hours at 85% humidity, then you can start that the two types of protons are start to uh, differentiate. You can see the distinct peaks of the two types of protons, and then as um the age aging progresses the uh pores are filled with water and we can or can identify only the protons coming from the water molecules now if we perform the same experiment by using uh deuterium then the pristine compound there are no single there is no signal coming from the pristine material because there is no deuterium atoms and then as the aging progresses in the deuterium, then you can see the two different types of protons, uh, the deuterium atoms from deuterium inside the cage, and the deuterium that has been exchanged uh, from the molecular cage. Uh, now, in order to further validate the interaction and the close proximity of water molecules within the cavities, we perform two 2D proton proton. Uh, correlation NMR uh, spectroscopy, uh, spin diffusion experiments. And then by increasing the mixing time uh, from 50 milliseconds to 120 milliseconds, we observed with the recorded signal uh, of diagonal signals, which demonstrate that there is interaction through space interaction uh, below five angstrom between the um, uh, protons of the molecular cage and the protons of water, which is a perfect validation of the presence of water molecules inside the molecular cage. Now, in order to shed light on the electronic properties of this material, we performed DFT studies. Uh, this is the band structure of the compound. The compound is a direct band gap semiconductor. Uh, starting with the uh, pristine material without water, and then with gradually uh, one, two, and four water molecules. Four water molecules per four ligands means 100% water loading. You can see there is minuscule difference 
in the uh, band dispersion, which means that water inclusion has minimum impact on the electronic properties of the material. We also wanted to see how many water molecules can fit inside the cavity. So we placed two water molecules, we relaxed the structure, and apparently only one water molecule can remain inside the cavity, where the rest are expelled into the interstitial space. And this uh, result is in perfect agreement with the vapor sorption studies, where we identified one water molecule per organic ligand as a total uptake. Uh, now, the generation of porosity gave rise, didn't affect the optical properties of the compound. Uh, and actually, the material is uh, a direct band gap semiconductor that ex exhibits broad light emission at room temperature. You can see a large energy shift between the absorption edge and the PL peak position. We wanted to set light behind the um, optical properties and this uh, broad light emission. So performed variable temperature PL studies. There is no PL peak, there's minimum PL peak shift, and there is almost minimum uh, change in the PL line shape, which probably was an indication that uh, the uh, broad light emission stems from the uh, um, uh, permanent defects and not self-trap accidents. In order to validate that, we performed uh, variable power PL studies where we observed that the PL emission saturates at higher power flux, which means that this emission stems from the permanent defects, permanent traps, which are filled completely at this higher power flux. And the, in terms of the, the PL lifetime, this is uh, um, in the range of a few uh, nanoseconds. Now, interestingly, the PL emission is un, uh, unchanged by the water treatment as you can see from the PLE, um, uh, PLE uh, spectra maps of the compound between the fresh and the six months that it won in water. Now, uh, to summarize, we managed to generate porosity to metal halide semiconductors. Uh, the materials exhibit record water stability for hybrid compounds. Uh, the optical properties are maintained after the water treatment. And of course, this sets the foundation for the creation of a new family of materials, which we call them porous metal halide semiconductors, which now allow us to fine tune not only the, uh, the optical properties, but also the porosity. And now this renders this compound suitable for applications such as solid state batteries, sensing, photocatalysis, water purification, and desalination applications. Uh, of course, I didn't do any of this uh, work. Uh, my group members, are responsible for all these uh, uh, nice results. I would like to thank our collaborators internationally, of course, our founding um, agencies, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you.